Truly, it is an honor to love and lead this church. Well, today, Church Unleashed, you're in for a treat. We're going to do some shotgun preaching. Do you even know what that is? It's basically, you're going to get all of us today. <laughs> so come on, let's just give it up for our entire church family. All right, so today we're going to spend a few moments talking about the code eight optional. Okay, I want everybody to say, this ain't optional. Let's say it one more time and say with more excitement, this ain't optional. Okay, so a code, what is a code? A code can mean one of two things. It's either a secret language system or a law, rule, or guideline. Now, today we're gonna smash kind of those definitions together, and today our code is our guiding language. Everybody say, guiding language. Now, the code, it gives us direction, it gives us vision, it gives us clarity, but more than that, it gives us unity. Everybody say unity. Unity. <laughs> All right. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.10 says this, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you will be perfectly united in mind and thought. We are the body of Christ, Church Unleashed, and we have a vision that is so powerful that what happens, it makes hell tremble. What it does is when you come united as a body of Christ, all of us together, we all have a target on our back now. When you say that I'm a follower of Jesus, you have to watch out because the Bible says Satan is out to seek, kill, and destroy. And what does he want to destroy more than anything else is the church of Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is very clear that we need to be united as one body with one vision because God has put us on Long Island to make Jesus famous. And the Bible says if there's any of you that cause division, mark them and have nothing to do with them. And so what Satan likes to do, because he's so cunning, he likes to get you a little offended. I didn't like what the pastor said. That person didn't invite me to their party, and I saw it on Facebook. So I'm not going to go to that church anymore. Whatever Satan can do to get you offended and get you not coming to church, he's going to do that. And so we as a body have to remember to become united because God has plans and purposes for all of our lives. And making Jesus famous is really the first one. And so today, I just want to reiterate those codes that we have here at Church Unleashed. Businesses have codes. Hospital have codes. Sports teams have codes. Restaurants have codes, computers have codes, websites have codes, and yes, God has codes. It's called the Bible, and it's our guiding language. And let me say this, you know, people so often get offended, but you know what? When you read the Bible, it's offensive. Nobody wants to hear that they're a sinner. And so, but the thing is, is that sometimes you have to let those offenses down and say, God, is this really you? Or is this something from the pit of hell that's trying to distract me from the purpose and the destiny that you have given me? And so today we're going to talk about Church Unleashed, our nine codes that drive our church. Everybody say it. This ain't optional. So code one, we make Jesus a priority. Jesus is the only way for people to experience heaven. We unashamedly preach, teach, and live Jesus. He is our purpose. 
God prepared heaven for us and sent Jesus to direct us there. You know, the Bible says Jesus is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. And no man can get to heaven but through him. And for people who, are, who don't believe that, that might be offensive to them, but that does not make it any less true. And so our job as Christians is to give truth in love. Jesus is the only way. For your neighbor, Jesus is the only way. For your family member that's far from God, Jesus is the only way. Church Unleashed, we only have a certain amount of time here on earth. And so we have to remember the greatest commandment that God gave us. Go and preach the gospel and make disciples. And if it's just Pastor Todd and I, that's a really hard task. If it's just the staff, it still is hard. But all of us together, in unity, in accord, we can make Jesus famous on Long Island. At that name, Jesus, everybody say Jesus. Demons tremble, sickness runs, freedom enters, hell shakes, and heaven roars. Are you hungry because Jesus is the bread of life? Are you thirsty because Jesus is the living water? He is the alpha, he's the omega, he's the king of kings, he's the lord of lords, he is your redeemer. He is your rock, he is your salvation. He is your protector. He is your fortress. At the name of Jesus, God shows up. Miracles happen, and victory takes place. There's no other name, and that's why we make Jesus a priority. And that leads us to code number two. We love people to life. We love people to life. Our mission as a church is to love people. It does not matter who they are. We simply love. You know, it's so easy in our natural, um, you know, I guess our sinful nature is to judge people. As soon as we see a person, we like to judge them, right? They're going to be this, this, and this without even knowing them. But God calls us to simply love them. Love motivates us to respond to need, accept all, and encourage the masses. We love the bruised and the broken. We embrace the hurting, the neglected, the marginalized, and the ignored. We welcome the rich and the poor. We accept the fact that the kingdom of God is made up of every tribe, every nation, every language, And so, you know what? Because we're going to be worshiping and loving on God and loving in people in heaven, we need to get started now. And when people see your love for each other, the Bible says that they see God in you. We choose to love people, not the people that look like us, but that look like God. Who is that? Every person created in the image of God. We choose to love people, not the people who think necessarily like us, not those who act necessarily like us, but we choose to simply love. Listen to what Jesus said in John 13, 35. It says this, so I give you now a new commandment. Love each other just as much as I have loved you. For when you demonstrate that same love I have for you by loving one another, everyone will know that you are my true followers. Love people to life. You know, it's so easy when you're offended or when you're hurt, you know, to kind of blast another person. I feel like within the last, maybe, I don't know, last year, um, there were some things on social media kind of blasting myself and, and the church and so much in me 
wanted to go back and put things on social media and trying to defend, you know, our, my position or our position. But, you know, the Bible says God is your defender. And so whatever you may be going through in life, when you get offended by somebody or you get hurt by somebody, people are people. People are imperfect. People are going to hurt you. But you know what? God is your defender. Love them anyway. I love this poem by um, Mother Teresa. People are often unreasonable, illogical, self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you're kind, people will accuse you of being selfish or have ulterior motives, motives, but be kind anyway. If you're successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you're honest and frank, people may cheat you, but be honest anyway. What you spend your years building, someone will destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find sincerity and happiness, they may be jealous, but be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world your best you have anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them. Anyway, boom, there goes the church. Here comes Pastor Matt. Our next code for today is we accept that life is short. Life is short. Eternity is real. This life is not the end. We're committed to live our lives on purpose and for a purpose. And how we live here influences who will be in eternity. Turn to somebody and say, life is short. Now turn to your second favorite person on the other side and say, life is short. That's what's up right there. Just taught somebody something. Psalm 90 says this. Teach us to realize the brevity of life so we may grow in wisdom. See, we need to learn and accept how short life is and allow God to teach us throughout that or in that principle to grow in wisdom, to grow in everything that he has for us to be. So real quick, let's get interactive. Raise your hand if you believe in heaven. That's good. Put your hands down. Raise your hand if you believe in hell. Here's the deal. Both are real. Whether we like to think about it or not, we're all going to die. Woohoo, church! Even more so, whether we like to think about it or not, hell is a real place. This isn't optional. This isn't an optional belief where we can, I'm going to believe in heaven, but I'm not going to believe in hell. It's not an optional thing. See, we love to believe that heaven is real. That's fun. That's easy. That's exciting. That's streets of gold that you could see through. It's so pure. You know, that's all the real great fun stuff. I once asked my dad, I was like, Dad, is there dodgeball in heaven? And he's like, yeah, probably. And I was like, all right, I'm in. So, you know, like, that, we love that. But we hate, or we sometimes even refuse to believe that hell is a real place. Why? Because, man, I don't want to, somebody that I love could wind up in hell. Somebody that I really, I'm related to could wind up in hell. Like, man, it's not fair, it's not fair, it's not fair. And I believe, and I actually agree that it's not fair. Here's what I think is not fair. It's not fair that even though we don't deserve it, Jesus came and paved the way for us. It's not fair that even though we sin almost every minute of our lives, Jesus came and he suffered and he died for us, to forgive us. That's not fair. It's not fair that human beings do everything we can to distance ourselves from God, yet he still draws closer and closer to us every single day. That's not fair. It's not fair that Jesus loved me so much, even though I don't deserve it. That is not fair. I think if, if we accept that life is short, we'll do everything we can to get everybody else to, to that same process. Because I think sometimes we, you know, we, we say this often as a church, you know, buildings are resources. Buildings are vehicles, right? They get us from one place to another. They, they kind of help us to, to just go and do my body is like, it's the same thing. My body's a vehicle that drives me from birth to eternity. And how I drive determines where I end up. My drive determines my destination. 
So if we accept that life is short, we will pay a lot more attention to how we're driving. How are you driving your vehicle? Are you committed to the journey that God has set before you, or are you constantly taking those detours of distraction? How are you driving? I want to ever go on a, uh, on a road trip. Come on, anybody have a road trip to Disney World, Florida? Not, not Disneyland in California. It's a long trip. But Disney World, road trips are, are, are the destination is awesome, but the journey can be torturous. Whether you're 3, 13, 33, the road trip of 22 hours or 18 if you're some other people, it is difficult. But here, here's the deal. Life is the same way. The destination could be amazing, but the journey sometimes, it gets tough. How do, you, how do you get there the quickest? You take the most direct route. Life, again, is the same way. We either get distracted on the detours or we know exactly where God has for us to go and our God-designed, designated lanes. And don't forget this. This is important. No one likes to road trip alone. I mean, I can pull up to the entrance of Disney World by myself and I'll still be excited. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, like, if you're in the car and there's no one else with you, or, or it's just more fun and exciting and fulfilling when other people are along the journey with you. So we accept that life is short. We will fill the seats in our vehicle. Matthew 7 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Don't just settle for being the few. Let's increase our few. Can we do that? Can we involve as many people as possible in this amazing faith that we have? Our next code, we trust God always. So when we accept that life is short, we need this next part. We trust God always. Why? Because, man, I only have so much little time. I got to do it. Blah, blah, blah. But when we trust God, the word works and we work the word. Hebrews 4 says this, For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, expose our innermost thoughts. The Bible is the most important tool that you have in your life, hands down. The Bible is the fuel of your vehicle. It's the fuel in your engine. It gets you from A to B. The problem with so many Christians today is that we, we tend to look at our Bible, our Bible reading, and that devotion time that we have with God is more like a, like a flippant Bible reading. Like, let me check it off my to-do list. Let me just, okay, I got it done for the day. I read a verse. I'm good. I'm going to go with that. And then sometimes we wonder why it's such a struggle to reach our destination. May I suggest to you that it's possibly because we are running out of gas along the way. We need to dive into the Word. When we dive into the Word, we learn how to trust God in every situation. There's people in this room who have been in so many different situations. So many, maybe, uh, dark times in your life that you've gone through, the most difficult times recently that you've gone through, challenging times that you've gone through. When you dive into God's Word, you learn how to trust Him always. You learn how to trust in the worst times, but you also need to know how to trust in the best times. When you get a promotion, you're making more money than you've ever made before in your life, and you now have more responsibility than you've ever had. You also, that's a great time. You need to learn how to trust God in that time. It's not only about, I need God when things are difficult. It's also about, I need God when everything's great. I also need God when things are average. When things are just kind of ho-hum, I need God in the midst of all of that. And how do we get to that place of trust? Dive into the Word. Why? Because it's alive. The Word of God is alive, and it is fresh. Every time you read God's Word, it comes to life. It speaks directly to your situation, your current situation, whatever that may be. We all have different, this is why I love God's Word. We all are in a different situation. There's like 200 situations in this room. We could each read the same passage, and God will speak directly to our situation. That's how we know it's God-breathed, it's inspired, it's alive, it's fresh. It's also hope. When we go through stuff, it is hope. It gives us hope. And it helps us to, to, it answers the question, man, how do I get through this? It's help, it's instruction, it's guidance, but it's also power. Don't just survive through life, thrive through life. How do we do that? Dive into God's word and trust him always. When we work his word, when we accept that life is short and we trust God always, our vehicles will not be big enough for all the people that want to come with us to heaven. And that is what it's all about. Boom goes the church. 
All right, say it with me too one more time. This ain't optional. This ain't optional. Awesome. Okay, so that brings us to code number five. That's not optional. We know a church alive is worth the drive. You guys know that saying, right, by now? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Priorities, right? We all have priorities. We all have things we try to put into place in the perfect spots, and we prioritize a lot of things, right? We'll prioritize sports games, kids' activities, restaurants. We'll go to the city with our friends. I was thinking about it. I was like, I prioritize food shopping. Well, I'm just saying. I don't know if there's anyone else out there because Whole Foods just opened up in Comac. So maybe a few of you might prioritize that. But we prioritize a heck of a lot of stuff, but we don't prioritize going to church. It's kind of weird. How do we not prioritize a life-giving, vibrant church? I'm pregnant. It's kind of obvious. But, or not. I don't know. (laughs) First time doing this. But, (laughs) I'm... (laughs) Thank you, guys. I am going to drive farther for a doctor, a good doctor, because my child alive is worth the drive. So I just want to say, what about your soul? Because that's just as important. Oh my goodness, your soul is extremely important. A soul alive is worth the drive. So what makes a church worth a drive? It's life, right? It's passion. Our passion for God will always be visible, and that visible passion is magnetic. That is what Code 5 is all about. Scripture declares, you are the light of the the world. A town on a hill cannot be hidden. Church unleashed. You are the light of the world. You've got the good stuff that this world needs. You are a church on a hill that cannot be hidden. Your passion for God is a haven of hope. It is a lighthouse to the lost. It is inspiration for those who are in over their heads. Um, We're not called Unleashed for nothing, people. I mean, like, seriously, have you ever heard a name like that? Church Unleashed. Unleash your faith, right? Unleash it. It shouldn't be hidden, so let it rip. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Let your faith rip. Your passion for God should be visible in every area of your life. Your commitment to the church body should be visible and seen and not ashamed of. Be an attractive Christian because there is nothing like, oh, worse, right? And that scares people away than unattractive Christians. And when you scare people away, you're ultimately scaring people away from Jesus. Opposite of the codes we've been talking about. So we have to set a good example of what it means to be a Christ follower. A church alive is worth the drive. It is worth the distance. It is worth the effort. It is worth refocusing your priorities. Church was never meant to be boring. Today is not boring, and it will continue not to be boring. How many of you know this church is not boring? That's for sure. But if you find that church is boring, you need to check what's going on the inside of you first and not blame others for your lack of passion. You want, if you want a, a visible passion that's extremely magnetic, right, what do you do? Well, Code 5, your passion for God should be found in your serving. It should be found in your giving. It should be found in your church attendance. It should be found in your consistency and your commitment to God's word, in your integrity, in your growing maturity. When you do that, look and see how fast people will follow you to church, right? Because a church alive is filled with people who are alive. They are filled with life. Live like the church. So church alive is worth the drive. That's right, you guys are good. Okay, so within a thriving, alive church, you have code number six. We are building a culture of honor. Every person desires honor. So here at Church Unleashed, we honor up and we honor all around. But hear me when I say that honor is not earned. Everyone deserves honor. The up and outer like we're talking about, the down and outer, the rich, the poor, people in authority and position that God has placed there, 
people that we agree with, people that we may disagree with, or really, 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 really disagree with, right? People of other faiths, thought, culture, lifestyle, no matter what the difference is, honor is never removed from the equation. God calls us to honor. But we're too busy honoring things that don't even matter sometimes, right? Like we'll honor appointments and we'll honor our jobs or possessions, but we miss what matters most, people. God put us on this earth to be used to just spread the word of Jesus to people. So we need to honor others. And we think we're going to find peace and love through politics or education or more stuff or filling all these voids. But you know what helps to change the culture of Long Island? It's honor. It's our love for Jesus that's expressed in valuing people we are surrounded by. But you know what the world's missing today? It's the culture of honor, right? I mean, we see it. You got to be, you, got, you have to see it. Sweet Lord. You know where it should be found, though? It should be found in people who say that they love Jesus. But you know where it's often misrepresented? In the church. Church unleashed. May that never be said of us that we do not know how to honor people. It is time that we raise the level of honor, that we honor one another, that we stop complaining and start honoring. It's time to start seeing people not as our enemies, but as children of God people who God put his thumbprint on, right? Because the truth is sometimes when I talk, it's like, honor, suck it up, do it. But when you really resolve, right, that God uniquely created people on purpose, he designed them for a purpose, he loves them, you will start to see people very differently. You will treat people differently, say things differently, value them, and ultimately you'll honor God's creation because everyone is worthy of honor. Why? Because God said so. So I said the last word, you can take it up with God if you don't like it, okay? But he said so. And the truth is, he leads by example. Our God has been honoring us since the beginning of time. And when you think about Adam and Eve and they sinned in the garden, right? They were naked and ashamed. What did our God do? He wasn't like there was consequences for sin, but he actually made them clothes to cover their nakedness. If that was us, we'd be like, You're, you stay naked. You run around nude. I don't even care. And last service I mentioned, like, there'd be more nude beaches around here. And then, I don't know, it turned into something else. And I don't go to nude beaches, so I just want to clear the air. Just put it out there. If you do, we're not judging you. I don't know. Let's move on. (laughs) Our God, he honors, right? Told you church isn't boring. And you know who was the best at showing honor who walked this earth? Jesus. He was awesome at it. Love and honor go hand in hand. He honored everyone he came into an interaction with. It was our Savior who said, people will know you are my disciples. If you love one another just as I loved you, like what Pastor Mary was saying, and that's when we're trying to explain that love and honor go hand in hand. God never tells us to pick and choose who we should honor. He tells us to honor. Scripture declares, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Devotion means hard work and commitment. Honoring someone above yourself means you cannot be selfish. But Church Unleashed, I know that you're going to pick up code number six. Six? And you're up for the challenge. Honor everyone around you. Honor is the difference maker in your marriage, with your children, in your friendships, in your communities, at your job. And it is a difference within our church. And that's why we value it. Because it can break down barriers. It can bring peace and chaos. And your actions of honor change lives. God honors honor. And when you honor, you are ultimately honoring him. Amen? Honor up, honor around, boom goes the church. Gina. Woo! We now know what man Gina were doing on vacation. Wow. We're going to have a talk about those nude beaches. Hey, look at somebody say, this ain't optional. 
What ain't optional? The code ain't optional. The code we're talking about today, just kidding, they were not at that beach. I'm just, because some of you are thinking, what? No, she's pregnant. It's prego brain, okay? You're okay. It's fine. The code we're speaking about today is what we live and breathe at our church. It's what drives Mary and I. It's what drives our staff. It's what drives all our volunteers. It's the code, that common language that governs and directs us. It's the code that drives our entire team. So code number seven, you ready? It's the most points we've ever had in a sermon, okay? Code number seven, we believe in big ask faith. Accent on the K. We believe in big ask faith. There is nothing that has ever been done great for God that did not, not require a leap of faith by someone. And I think so often what we do is we kind of insult God with low-level requests. God, give me an A on this test. That ain't faith. Study. Come on, is that not an amen spot? I, I thought that was an amen spot. We can never, and we will never be that kind of church that has small dreams, small goals, small hopes, small agendas. They must be larger. If you and I can achieve it, it ain't faith. If you can do it without God, you don't need faith. But when what God has called you to do, you know it is doomed to fail without his intervention, that's when faith steps in. It is not faith when you know, hey, I got the skill set to do this. No, it's faith when you're like, I'm not the person. Why have you called me to do this? God, why are you asking me to step out in faith to do this? Church, we will always ask a big God for big things. We're not going to insult him with small requests. We're not going to insult him or waste his time with the little thing. We want to say, God, we want you to do something big in our church, something big in every life, something big in every person. The Bible says this, for anything we do that doesn't spring forth from faith is by definition sinful. That means... If you're not acting, living, and breathing by faith, you are in sin. Oh, but let's go talk about this group of people that sin bigger than me. Or let's go, no, if you ain't got faith, you are living in sin. I didn't say it. It's right there. It's in pink and purple. Black, if you're reading the Bible. For anything that we do that is not with faith is by definition, sinful. Paul was being very clear to the church that we must live and breathe our lives through faith. That means what we have to do is we've got to trust that when I step over the ledge of this decision, God is going to build my walkway. Some say, oh, the bridge is already built. Now I can run. That ain't faith. Faith is trusting God. You said go there, but there's no bridge. Go. And when you step out, you're going to make that. That bridge is going to be made by God because of your faith. I wonder how many people live a daily life of sin because they live on low or limited faith. That will get all bent out of shape on all these other sins or the pet sins or these little things or these huge things that are more visible. What about our lack of faith that is often invisible? People don't see. See, not believing God for the impossible, according to Paul, was sin. What impossible thing do you need to start believing for again? What miracle do you need that you just, ah, I gotta, God's never going to turn it around. Well, then you're living in sin. Because when you say that it is impossible, you're denying the character of God. And when you deny the character of God, you've denied God. That is the highest form of sin. See, I believe that this God that we serve can do anything that he wants to do. There's not any limitation on God. 
There is nothing our God cannot do. There's nothing that he can't walk into and change the situation around. Cancer's too big for God. Are you kidding me? This situation's never, are you kidding me? We serve a big God. And that's why this church must have some big ass faith. We must ask God for the impossible and believe him. Leave the results up to him. But I am not going to limit my faith. I am going to trust my God. See, it's really about our faith. I'm talking about a faith that moves the mountains of sickness. A faith that moves the mountains of loss and brokenness and divorce, bitterness, debt, mental illness, all the social injustices in our world today. I'm talking about a faith that not that will not allow life to break you, but will push God to build you to the person he's designed you to be. We at Church Unleashed believe in big faith. Not in ourselves, but in God. Because it's him that does what he wants to do, and we get to be part of it. Code number eight, we reject mediocrity. Nothing in us should ever allow us to do the bare minimum in anything we do. A lack of excellence, a lack of drive, is an indicator of our faith in Christ. God did not throw your life together. Why are you throwing your life together? I just said, whatever, hey. Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. Really? That's not even biblically correct. What God designs will be. I want to be part of his design. Oh, she's going, I mean, she's talking about new beaches. Just whatever will be, will be. I'm just going to go through life. Whatever happens, I'm not going to study. God, whatever your will is on that grade, you shall give me. It's an F. Whatever happens, it's going to go through. You know, God, I want, to, I want to be fit, and I want to be healthy. I want to have a long life. And you're sitting there shoving Twinkies and stuff in your mouth, and your only exercise you get is lifting the fork from the table to your face. You say, God, I want to live a long life, and I want to bless you with my life. And yet you're not even taking care of yourself. Excellence is, you know what? Every part of my life, body, soul, spirit, must be excellent. I must be excellent at work. I must be excellent at home. I must be excellent at church. I must be excellent in how I carry myself with people, how I talk to people. God, we must reject mediocrity. You know, I'll tell you, it's in our culture today. Mediocre is acceptable. It should not be acceptable in the house of God. It is said of Daniel that he had an excellent spirit. He could only bring his very best every single time. The Bible says it this way. Soon, by his extraordinary spirit, Daniel distinguished himself among the other administrators and satraps. So the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. What did the the king see? A spirit of excellence. He didn't see a spirit of mediocre. Some of us wonder why we don't get the promotion. Well, we're lazy. Amen, Pastor. Thanks. Are you telling me to work harder? Yes, I am. Am I telling you to set yourself so that you show the excellency of God through your life? Yes, I am. Am I telling you that you ought to do your job with excellence at work? Yes, I am. Am I encouraging you to reflect your holy God who excellently put your life together? Yes, I am. We must live a life of excellence. We must reject mediocrity. Do you bring God your best or do you bring him your leftovers? Too often we bring him our leftovers and we treat God and you just take his name and rearrange it and you get D-O-G. We treat him like a dog when we bring him our leftovers. God is not a leftover kind of God. He deserves the first and the best in everything that we have. See, we want to bring God our best at Church Unleashed. We want to leave it all on the field every single time we're together. We want to die empty. I do not want to go to heaven with dreams that I did not accomplish. I want to die with every dream that God put in my spirit, every hope he has for our church, our family, our lives. I want to make sure when I enter into heaven, I die empty. I do not want to take dreams with me to the grave. I want them to be realities. I don't want to stand before the Lord and say, I dreamed of this, God. I want to be able to say, God, I did this for you. 
I lived my life for you. I served you. I gave it all. Church, if we all gave it all, Long Island would know Jesus. See, I'll tell you, unashamedly, I want the best buildings for our churches. I want the best kids program. I want the best youth ministry, the best dream team members, the best volunteers, the best worship, the best services, the best preaching. We at Church Unleashed will not settle for mediocre. It is an insult to our excellent God. I want to make sure we bring our best. It is not in our DNA to be average. Let's set our standards higher. And then last, before I lose my voice, code number nine. We are not for everyone. I know some of you are like, wait, 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 wait. But we say everyone's welcome. Yeah, of course. Don't read too deep into this. We are for everyone, but we are not for everyone. You catch the difference? Everyone is welcome here, but not everyone's going to embrace what we do, why we do it, how we do it. And to be honest, that's okay. We try our very best to do what God has called us to do as a church. And we would love to make every single person happy. But at the expense of making God happy, I'd rather have you unhappy. There are so many people that we talk to and like, man, pastor, if you would just do this. Or, and I'm always like, well, why don't you do that? God didn't tell me to do it. You do that. And as soon as I tell them to do it, after they told me to do it, they don't do it. So what they're really saying is, Pastor, you're my servant to do what I've asked you to do. No, we're all mutually serving Christ. And maybe God didn't put it on our hearts to do. Maybe he did put it on your heart. But you're too non-excellent. Is that a nice way to say that? The reality is for me, I'm a people pleaser. I want to make everybody happy. That's why I've had to learn to be direct, which is sometimes offensive, I'll be honest. I've had to learn direct because I will say yes to everybody. In fact, that's why now when somebody says, hey, I'd like to talk to you, hey, call Bensi. Because I'll say yes to you, and I'll have five appointments at 1 o'clock on the same day because I can't say no. So I've had to learn to be direct because I do want to make people happy. But I will not choose your happiness over his happiness any day. I can't do it. I must make him happy. I must honor him with the calling that he's placed on my life. Because the truth is, when God called me at 18 years old, you were not there. When God set me apart as a pastor and anointed me to lead, you were not present. You don't know the voice of God that he spoke into my life and my dreams, my hopes, and the goals he planted in my spirit. You were not there. Truth is, now I look and say, God, I'm so glad nobody else was there because they would all discourage me. They would all end up saying, well, that wasn't God. God couldn't have said that to you. No, that's too big. No, we believe in big-ass faith. I'm going to say it because some of you are getting offended. Let me ask you, how many of you think Jesus was a great leader? Come on, let me just see your hand. You think Jesus was a great leader? Okay, as some of you, I, I don't know what you were thinking when you came in. All right. I believe Jesus was the best leader that ever walked planet Earth. How many of you think that, man, if Jesus was here today, we'd all just follow him wherever he went? Okay, some of you still, whatever you're sipping this morning, I don't know. You want to hear something about the greatest leader that ever walked planet Earth? He could not make everyone happy. If I think I can make everyone happy, you know what I've just said? I'm better than Jesus. Is that scary? I mean, Jesus embraced everyone. He spent time with the down and outer, the up and outer, politicians and leaders. And then he was able to find those who did not have. And he spent time. But not everyone embraced who he was. Listen to this verse. And so from that time on, many of the disciples turned their backs on Jesus and refused to be associated with him. 
You know what I think is crazy about this? Is the verse reference. John 6, 6, 6. If Jesus was for everyone, but was not for everyone, because not everyone choose, chose him, what makes us think we are? I mean, we like high energy worship. I love watching our singers dance and celebrate before the Lord. Some people aren't going to like that. Some people are going to be used to this. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. All service long, it's... We should all just do this together. This would be fun. It hurts my knees. I'm too old. See, some people aren't going to like the lights and the music and, and the incense machine, because it's not a fog machine. It's an incense machine. We burn incense before the Lord. And so some people aren't going to like that, and that is okay. We want to engage the next generation. We are not just about today. We are about tomorrow. I want our children to know God. Some may not share that passion. It's okay. We don't do what every other church does. And that's okay. We're not like every other church. And every other church isn't like us. There's a million different types of churches for a million different types of people. When God birthed this vision in Mary and, I heart, Mary and my heart, when he spoke to us and started this church 11 years ago, he gave us a very clear direction. And now we're starting to see that direction made known. We still know what God has called us to do. We haven't second-guessed it. There's days sometimes we're saying, God, really us? Like, why not somebody else? There's better people than us out there. But God chose us and put us here. See, I want to make sure that I make God happy in everything. I work relentlessly for that. That's why I'm a workaholic. I work for the church. I love the church. I can work, Mary will tell you, I could work 130 hours a week, probably 168 hours a week, because I love the church. I love what God's called us is 168 hours in a week, so that'd be every hour. Okay, anyway. So it probably wouldn't be that much, because I do need to sleep, because I like eight hours of sleep a night, but okay, that's a whole story. But I love what I do, because what I do doesn't just impact my bank account. It impact, impacts eternity's account. And I will work tirelessly for that. I want to make sure that I make God happy in every decision I make. And I don't get it right all the time. And we try our hardest. But I want to make sure that he's happy. God did not call us to make people happy. You will never find that in scripture. We live to make him happy. And if we live to please an audience of one, at the end of our lives, we could say, I fought a good fight finish the race, and I've been faithful. Boom goes the church.